co-host from Between Sisters, Keish. Hey. <laughs> and honestly, the most riveting episode thus far. Because we're talking about something that's kind of taboo, especially within the Black community. Mm-hmm. And that is having an experience of another dimension. Um, what do you mean by that, Kaya? I'm talking about having an out-of-body experience. And this particular episode is near and dear to me because Keisha and I have been somewhat on the same plane as far as trying to find, you know, our our judge spiritually. And this is why we're here today. Yay. You take it away, boo. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Um, anybody that's watching, I want to just make you aware that it's not by accident that you tapped into this video. So if you're watching this today, God, whoever your maker is, wanted you to watch this. Um, if you know anybody that needs to watch this, if you feel like this is not for you or for someone else, please send this to them, DM them, text them this video, because this is really important. There's a lot of people out there that are not happy. And we're going to discuss how you can get peace and happiness through your life. Again, Kaya was talking about how we've been on a spiritual journey. That's what I've been calling the spiritual journey. And, um, I've been on a spiritual journey for uh, a couple years. I had my out of body experience in October of 2019. Prior to that, um, I'll discuss who I was prior to the October 2019 experience. Um, A lot of you know from the other videos that I am a mother of four. I have three girls and I have a son. Um, The son is the oldest, the three girls live with us. Um, I'm a visiting nurse. A lot of you know that through the videos that I discussed a lot of times being a a visiting nurse and being in patients' homes. So prior to me meeting my husband, him and I have been actually married for 23 years. And that's Kaya's brother. So that's the connection between me and Kaya. Um, (laughs) My husband is the oldest of 12. Um, And prior to meeting him, I was a happy-go-lucky woman. I was happy. He met me when I was 20, going on 21. I was in college. I was partying. I I had a full-time job, going to school full-time. And just enjoying life. I lived with my mother. She was a single parent. Um, she was a nurse herself. When I was going to college, I was going to college to become a business management major. Um, sidebar, before I met my husband, way before that, I went to Hampton University. So shout out to HU. I'll tell my age a little bit because I was in a couple of DJ Envy's classes. <laughs> he wouldn't remember me, but I was in a couple of his classes. Um, there's always a battle about the who the real HU is. And then I ended up going to um, Montclair State, and that's where I pledged. Alpha Kappa Alpha. So, excuse me to all my sorors. Oh, go put the piggy up. They'll kill you. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. That's put my piggy up? No, you can't, boo. No, you can't. Because <laughs> you're not an AKA, but you you can pledge. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> anyway. I don't be no sticky AKA anyway. No, we are the first and the final. I can't put my piggy up. No, you can't, boo. Tell them, Soros. <laughs> Listen, God gave me this pinky. Well, you only time you can put that pinky up when you getting some tea and you drinking some tea and Look, you getting some God tea. gave me this pinky. I'm a <laughs> <laughs> So, anywho, so make um, fast forward a little bit. Going back to us, I was a happy-go-lucky person. Met my husband, happy-go-lucky. We got married a year later. Um, right away, we had kids. Like, right away. So, Giving birth to my first child, um, right now she's 23 years old. So I would say I've been dealing with depression for 23 years. Um, I had just, uh, what is it called? Postpartum depression. Didn't know I had postpartum depression. So for a whole year, I literally was going to doctors trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, when, at one point, they thought I had a, t- a brain tumor. So they were checking to make sure nothing was wrong with my brain. They did an MRI, CAT scan, all kind of stuff. Um, so finally, uh, well... Let me wind it. I had Medicaid, so I went to a clinic, and the doctors, he didn't even look at, he didn't even talk to me. He said, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. You're, you're depressed. My mother was standing there with me, and and so we were like, wait a minute, you didn't even know who, what my name is, barely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I still went on my journey. Finally, I, I found a doctor who sat me down and said, you know what, I see this a lot, and you're depressed. 
So she put me on medication. Um, I'm, and so I will say this sidebar, I couldn't talk about this years ago. So, you know, when people open up to you about depression, it's like them opening up their top and showing you their bra. So, um, but now I'm not ashamed of it. Um, and I, I encourage anyone who's dealing with depression, whatever kind of mental disorder you have, I encourage you to speak about it because there's so many people who are silently dealing with these um, disorders. So going and back- And it's so real. It's so yeah, real. It's so it really common. Is. It was. So I was so embarrassed about my depression that my husband didn't know I was diagnosed with depression for a whole year. I was on Prozac for a whole year and he did not even know. And he didn't know? He didn't know. One thing he did notice, he did notice I had a big change in me. So he saw the dip where I just, I, I would wash dishes and be knocked out for hours. So he saw that after, yeah. he saw, he saw when I started taking this medication, I became a different person. I mean, I remember like about a month after taking the medication, I cleaned my house from top to bottom. He came home from work and he was looking around like, okay, <laughs> you know, he was all happy. Okay. Everything all right? Yeah. <laughs> so Somebody when I come to visit? That, yeah. One thing I remember is I kept saying to the doctors, okay, so I have this depression for, I have this diagnosis of, of depression. When is it going to stop? And no one could be honest with me and tell me there's no stop date to this. Like this is probably forever. Um, mm -hmm. So I kept saying to myself, this can't be the, the ultimate answer for me for the rest of my life of being depressed. So okay. what happened with me was, as I'm taking my Prozac, as time went on, I needed to be on, be on a higher dose, a higher dose, a higher dose. Because you go through like a, a chain where you, you're feeling good, woo, and then you start feeling down again. And that was depressing, knowing that the medication was going to be wearing off. Um, and then in the midst of me um, on the medication, I got pregnant. So then I abruptly stopped. There's medication for pregnant women. I, I personally didn't take it because when I read up on the medications, it showed that your child could come out mentally challenged. And I was like, you know what? I'd rather give my child a chance and not get on, um, and get off the medication temporarily. So each time I got pregnant after that, I had two more pregnancies after my first one. I would stop and go, stop and go. And so ultimately I ended up on Lexapro for years. Fast forward, so now I was a housewife, depressed, um, and I thought the answer to being happy was you have to have, a, uh, you have to have something tangible. Um, and I noticed every time I had set a goal for something, the goal would happen and I still was unhappy. Um, I, a lot of my challenges was being a housewife, being, um, because at one point we lived on one income. So then it was a part of my life or our lives where we had our three girls and we had opened up a dollar store. So we were business owners. So you would think being a business owner, okay, you should be happy because at the first couple of years we actually did great. But what I noticed was nothing made me happy. I was very depressed. And I, I forgot to mention a big piece of it, of my depression was that my second child, when she was born on the same day she was born, my mother passed away. So my mother was, that was in a huge hospital. piece. Yes, yes. So my mother was in one hospital dying and I was in another hospital giving birth. So then that was another tr trauma in my life. And then, you know, so going back after we, after she passed away, um, we opened up our dollar store. Had the dollar store, um, wasn't happy. Like I, I was one of those people, I was situationally happy. Like if we went out, mm -hmm. I would be happy for the moment. But even while I was in the moment, I knew that once the clock ticked and we had to leave or, or, you know, I was going back to my regular life. So like if I was on vacation, I would enjoy the vacation, but I knew that this happiness was only temporary. I was not enjoying anything about my daily life. I was miserable. Um, but one thing, a lot of people, when I, I was very voicious about being depressed and initially my husband didn't like that. He kind of felt like I was telling the world, like, he's like, honey, you don't have to tell everybody you meet you're depressed. Um, also too, I had family members that would literally tell me, stop claiming you're depressed. You're not depressed. It's all in your mind. So that mm -hmm. also <laughs> got me down. Cause it's like, how do you tell someone that they're not depressed when they have been diagnosed with depression? Um, I remember, um, later on when I went to nursing school, my psych teacher said, would you tell a diabetic not to take their insulin and be a soldier and stop taking that insulin? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so she said it pisses her off 
when she hear people who are on who have mental disorders and their family members are telling them stop claiming it you don't have mm -hmm. it so going back so we had the doll store and then in the midst of having the doll store um the economy started changing so i knew okay i got to go back to school and so i went back to school and um i became a, a registered nurse so in the midst of going back to school um i thought that once i became a nurse it was like this because I was working at something. So I was excited at working at something. And I just knew that once I got to become a nurse, everything my, was going to be, everything was going to be okay. All the depression is going to stop. I stayed on, I was always on my medication, um, but I still was unhappy. I, I couldn't find happiness nowhere. In the midst of all of that, I did have God. So I know your previous episode, you guys talked about church. I want to give a shout out to my mother because <laughs> even though she's not here, I got to shout her out. My mom was a type that she would work like six, seven days a week, work 12 hour shifts. So when she came home from work on a Sunday morning, you better get your behind up and go to church. Mm -hmm. you know, so even though she went and laid down, you going to church. Mm -hmm. um, I did from the time I was a little girl, my, uh, my grandmother took me to church. And then when my grandmother passed away and I was able to drive myself or my mother, I would go with my mom. There were times that she would, um, go to church. Um, when I was in my clubbing days, before I got married, my mom like, I don't care if you come home from the club at eight o'clock in the morning, you going to church. And I, I was in the, the, the choir, I was in the usher board. I was doing all kinds, I was in Sunday school, whatever you name it, I was Sunday, doing. Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> then, you know, choir, choir rehearsal was during the week. Mm -hmm. You know how that was, right? <laughs> sure do. <laughs> Sure you know, my and my girlfriends knew like the rule of my house was you 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 want to go club and you better do you better do some church so um you know so i had I, I brought that up to say i had a foundation in god currently i'm not a holy roller and i don't even think i was ever a holy roller when i was growing up as a kid uh, my mom wasn't a holy roller but there was always god in my life so what church did was it gave me a conscience so with it giving me a conscience, there were times when, you know, I was, I had my, I had my days when I was not the greatest person. But one thing I could honestly say was I was never that person that would hurt other people. Like when I was doing dirt. Intentionally. It, yeah, yeah. Like when I was doing dirt back in the day, it was dirt that it was, it would have hurt me, but not yeah. nobody else. I was not out there trying to get nobody else's man. I was not, you know, it was just was dirt I was doing to myself. I ain't gonna go any further. I'm a married woman now. So I wanna, <laughs> I need a, I need my husband to keep me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got you girl. I got you. Yeah. So, okay. Good. So the whole, the whole depression thing, I'm really harping on this depression because a lot of you have depression now, a lot of you have anxiety now, and a lot of you either are on medication and it's still unhappy, or some of you are not choosing to be on medication. You're trying all kind of other things um, besides medication. Um, what, whatever it, you think is working for you, whatever you choose to do, that's on you. So I will yeah. say, and we'll talk about that a little later, I'm currently not on medication and I don't need medication because of where I'm at right now spiritually in my life. Uh, but the reason why I stopped being on medication has nothing to do with the fact that it really wasn't working for me. Um, it was the fact that um, with people who are depressed, we have a tendency to procrastinate on everything. I'm not, and, mm -hmm. and please, if you are depressed, don't say, oh, well, don't put me in that category. For me, with my depression, mm -hmm. like, um, I would avoid seeing my doctor. And so with that being said, I would use the pharmacy as my doctor. I would call him up and say, can you, uh, can you do me a favor and call the, call the doctor and give me a refill? <laughs> so, and they did it. They were doing it. And finally, my doctor was like, tell her. Tell her she needs to come needs in. To come in the office. And I was like, I ain't going in the office. So mm -hmm. my the office is like literally around the corner. Okay. <laughs> but depression oh, did you that. was going a block and a half. Yeah. <laughs> actually... So anywho, uh, unfortunately, because of my depression, I have a lot of shame and guilt because I feel like I did not appreciate being a mother for years. I I didn't see happiness i love my kids i would die for my kids mm -hmm. so but i didn't smell the roses when i had my kids when they were smaller mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so sometimes they, their history of being children is kind of like a um it's a vague memory 
I, like, I remember being that mother, like, every time I had to drop my kids off every morning at school, I didn't appreciate doing that. It was like, hell, I go every, you know, so, like, I didn't mm-hmm. appreciate. Now, honey, like, I, my last kid, she's 16. I love taking her to school because I, I appreciate the fact that I have a kid I can take to school. There's many people that don't have kids. But before mm-hmm. I had my, before I, you know, was on my spiritual journey, I was just complaining about every, every little thing. Um, but I, I think I think you you really need to reiterate the fact that you had we both did that is one thing that we we was the same we both had kids very young and got married did. very young we did yeah because I was twenty one going on twenty two if I could do if I could do it over again I would have had um, I would have had my kids at after thirty five I know a lot, a lot of women were like oh that's old listen no it's not. And because you know what, women who are a thirty-five and above, I, I I admire them. They are like the best moms ever. Like, oh yeah, you know, they're the arts and crafts. Yeah, you know, they, you know, they come together. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just like, yeah, like <laughs> mm-hmm. they enjoy being moms. Like you know, oh my god. So I, you know, I give kudos to any mother that is able to really enjoy that journey with their kids. Um, we were pregnant at the same time. That's right. That's right. Because Chris is, um, how, he's what? Yeah. He, he's going to be 23 in February. That's right. And, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you go through any depression after having Chris? With Chris? I don't remember. Like that, that part, uh, I actually found some pictures and I found a picture of me when I was pregnant with him and I, I sent it to him. And I was like, this, I think, is probably the only picture that I have when I was pregnant with you. Okay. But um, with him, I don't remember. But with that, definitely. Okay. 1,000%, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you had depression? Really? It was bad. Oh, it was bad. wow. Okay. Okay. How did you get through that? Or are you Am I get- through it? <laughs> <laughs> Am I through it? You on your journey. You on your journey. I'm on my journey. It's a it's a process, and yeah. I and I had to kind of retrain my brain with certain things. Okay. You know, because like you said, being in church all that time, and you know, we was in church every day. God sent. Yeah, yeah. You know, and He only sent seven. How am I in church nine days? <laughs> you know, nine days a week. But yeah. um, yeah. So you you don't really have the time to actually grow up and find out who you are for yourself. Yeah. And then when you have kids so young, yep. you don't have time to find time to, to for yourself and learn yourself. It's now mommy mode, yeah. wife mode. Yeah. You know, when I go to these um, fancy baby showers where the girls got the long train, and especially the ones that it's their first baby. When it's their first mm-hmm. baby, I'll be sitting in the corner like, girl, you don't know what like you're about, what you about to go through. I'd be like, hmm. You about to, you about to you about to experience real life, especially and and this is no shade, but especially for women who are not married and are not living with the guy. Mm-hmm. So, because it's, it's, a, it's a different yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask out the marriage part. If you're not living with the guy of the of the, mm-hmm. of the child, it, child, I, listen, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> but yeah, good. <laughs> go. But you had a husband, you were living with your, yeah, obviously you were yeah. living with your husband and you had your kids, but. Yeah, I still was depressed your, and, yeah. um, and, and, you know, I was, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed by my depression and I didn't know, you know, a handful of people knew um, when my mom was alive, I was able to talk about my depression with her. Um, I had mentioned that Keisha's birthday party um, that, it was only Keisha and my mom were the only two for a year that knew I, I was depressed. And I remember the day I found out I was wow. depressed, I actually, I actually came home and she called me about something and I said, girl, like I was really dead. I said, girl, I just found out I'm the, I just got diagnosed with depression. And I remember that night not being able to sleep because I told her my secret about being depressed. Like back then when you, mm. yeah, like, yeah, yeah like it I, was taboo. It was yeah, taboo. taboo. It was like somebody trying to uh, come out the closet telling their family that they're gay. Like that's what it yeah, was yeah. back then. Um, and so even down to, like I said, with my husband, God bless him. Cause now he works on the site for 
and he can appreciate my um my diagnosis a lot better but then he wasn't working on, on a psych ward and so he was I don't know if he was embarrassed but he didn't like the fact I would tell people and it was not like I was knocking on neighbor's door they told me I'm depressed it wasn't like that but anytime I met somebody who was going through sadness I would open up about okay this is the journey I'm going through. You, you would share your testimony yes 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 so when I got pregnant with my second one I was afraid but my mom said, no, 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 we're not talking on that level. You're going to keep that child. You're a married woman and, you know, your finances may not be the greatest, but I'm here because she was there with the first one. And, and at that time, by the time I got pregnant with my second one, she was living in the house with me and my husband. Sidebar, we actually were looking for a um, two-family house when I was pregnant. And while we were looking for the, let me tell you, so we went through three um, real estate agents. Um, the first two was with my mother. Then after my mom passed away, we went to a third one. But the first two, they literally, we went through one. She, she got tired of us. We went through another one and we were literally, it was to the point, it was kind of scary. Like we just couldn't find a house that can fit us. And there was one house that we found. And the question was, what if my, cause I wasn't paying none of the bills. It was just going to be between my husband and my mother. And the question between the two of them was, if one of them got sick, could the other one pay all the bills? Pay the mortgage, yeah. And my mother said one day, we were, I remember we were in the car on the next, on the way to one of the next houses. She said, you know, we're going to find that house. She said, it might mean, and she said, don't, I might sound morbid right now. Don't get offended. She said, but it might, it might be a house where the, there's a little old lady in the house and she, um, she has to die first before we get the house. So we're just, she said, God is going to give us a house. It just may be meaning that the owner has to die before we get it. Not meaning that um, we wanted somebody to die, but come to find out, we had to wait till she passed away in order to buy our home. So that was a little like kind of- That was crazy. Yeah. So once she passed away, then we bought our home and, and then, you know, the, the rest is history. We're still in that house now, yeah. currently. Um, so now I, we had the dollar store. I go back to school for nursing, um, became a nurse. Um, my first year as a nurse was hell. I was extremely, I think that pushed me over the edge of my depression. I literally would go to work five days a week and go and be sleeping. If I was not at work, I was in my bed. So that first year I, I second guessed myself on was nursing for me because I felt like I was not doing real nursing. I felt like I was not helping anyone. It was a lot of politics around it. So that well, just well, added to my when you life. when you um when you graduated from nursing school, you guys had a party at your house. Yes. And we celebrated the fact that you graduated from nursing school. Yes. But one thing I want to point out is that that was the first time that I think all of us as a whole knew that you were suffering with depression because when you gave your your speech, okay. You said, I battled for a long time and my husband has been right there, you know, do it all. And that's when everybody was like, oh. Yeah. Because if we don't know, you know what I mean? We yeah. Don't... You don't know. Right, go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm glad you brought that up because um, I forgot I had <laughs> said it at that time. I didn't forget that. I, I, um, I, I remember where I was standing when you said that. Okay. <laughs> that's, and I don't have a good memory. <laughs> but I remember exactly where I was standing when you said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that was you know. So, you know, and and, and what going going back to the whole thing where I I thought that every time I reach another level, I would be happy. So I wasn't happy. Like I, a lot of you saw me laughing. Like you know me, I'm a jokester. I've always been like that from the time I was younger. So I would come around y'all and be joking and laughing. Um, but deep in my inside of me, I was hurting and I was crying in the, on the inside. To the point I became paranoid. A lot of depressed people stay to themselves. They don't. Um, and they think that everybody's trying to, um, are they talking about me? You can yes, just be whispering, yes. whispering about, you know, you got that stock tip or you, you go into the <laughs> store, buy me something, you know, but you yes. like, they over there talking about me. Yeah. Yeah, that's and it that's could be something totally. No, <laughs> that's how we feel. <laughs> if I see you looking at me too long, oh, you, oh, you 
you're, yeah. you're talking about I, I, I know she was over there talking, <laughs> talking about me. I knew it. Yes. <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I ain't never like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what we know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lord Jesus. The things I went through. Mm -mm -mm. So as, as, as you were in your um now you're in your rn mode you you're in the job for over a year and you thought that these mofos is like let's get her you know what it was i was in a system where and i'm not gonna say the culture but this one particular culture was running the building and mm -hmm. so the black nurses and i'm not trying to make this a racial thing um the black nurses were the bottom of the barrel, even if you had an RN on your um your tag. It was so bad that they didn't even want to give me the tag that said RN. They wanted everybody to know, think that I was a nurse's aide and there's nothing wrong with being a nurse's aide. But, but they didn't, look, they look didn't, I went through school. Yeah, they I didn't want to. I was in, I was. Mm -hmm. I was like the only registered nurse in the building that was black that didn't have the, the big RN on the bottom. I'm like, really? Every time, y'all, oh, no, we ran out. We ran out, really? Well, the reason why I know I ain't going crazy because my girlfriend who's non-black came like two months after me and she had one. Oh, who gave that to you? So-and-so in the office. Oh, okay. Anywho, but that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> that's another story. The lady that gave me, that hooked me up with the job, I'll never forget this because she was, um, I met her a couple times as a, as a hospice nurse because what happened was my first year, while trying to find a, a job in a hospital, I worked as a rehab slash nursing home, nursing home nurse. So there were hospice nurses coming to the rehab center. And I would ask all of them, there's one particular, I'm gonna call her Lisa. Her name wasn't Lisa, but I'm gonna call, give her the name Lisa. Lisa came and, um, and I would ask a lot of questions about being a hospice nurse and she hooked me up. She actually, one day, the, the manager of hospice department that she worked for, came to um to oversee what lisa was doing by that point i had already spoke to the nurse manager on the phone she knew i wanted the job so lisa brought her to me and was like so and so this is the lady i, I told you about this is the lady that you know i told you sh you should hire make a long story short i had to wait a good like three four months before i was able to get in but they told me that whenever the next spot comes up you'll be in got the job <laughs> Lisa, because she was per, a per diem nurse for hospice, Lisa came like maybe a month after I started and she sees me in the office and she goes, what are you doing here? I was like, hey, Lisa, I'm on Chippery. Hey, Lisa, how you doing? She's uh -huh. like, hey. She said, I didn't know you wanted to be a hospice nurse. I thought she was joking because I'm like, this lady clearly hooked me mm. up for the job. She yeah. was like, she was dead up. She's like, I didn't know you wanted to be a hospice nurse. I'm like, Lisa, you don't remember hooking me up? A conversation. Her. Yeah, because she brought a nurse manager to my face. This lady did not remember. So that's enough. how many how many years was it? It had to be like three months. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. I, and I thought she was joking, but I realized yeah. she was serious. She was dead up. The Holy Spirit used her as a conduit to get me that job. Girl, and 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 then said bye. Yeah, <laughs> that was what it was. All right, bye. So I'm a hospice nurse. I did hospice nursing for seven whole years and I enjoyed it. Um, initially, my family was very concerned because of my depression. They were like, you mm -hmm. really want to be, <laughs> have a job. You want to be around death. Yeah, I was, and literally. I, you, I had a whole new respect for death. I literally was around death all week long, all week mm -hmm. long. Um, mm -hmm. But I actually had a whole new respect for death and it actually, get, it was therapy for me with my mother's death because so, my mother died at 48 years old so it actually I, I actually had a respect for the fact that she died young and i realized that you're put on this earth for a reason and you're when your due date is up whether you're a day old or 100 years old that's when it's your time to go so i had a whole new respect for death um so i'm glad i, I did hospice nursing um so doing hospice nursing the job was not depressing i still was unhappy as a person still unhappy i was just still like a grumpy old listen did you then feel I, that you had the support the support that you needed from the people closest to you i don't even know if my family was equipped to help me because we were not educated on depression so i i can be honest with you if it was not me as a person depressed and it was somebody else in my family i don't think i was equipped to help that person 
So that's why when I look back, I'm not mad at anybody because we just, it was, that was something that was never discussed in household. You know, we heard about alcoholism, but we didn't hear like what caused the alcoholism. Yeah. 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 Um, What's the root? We only yeah. know, we only know the answer. We don't know the, the actual problem. Yeah. You know, exactly. Exactly. One of the things I yeah. realized, I didn't realize until recently in the last two years, one of the reasons why I got burnt out with hosp yeah. with hospice nursing is that, um, I'm an empath and I think you and I mm -hmm. discussed it before mm -hmm. for anybody that doesn't know what an empath is. And a lot of you are empaths and don't even know it. And that's why a lot of you get stressed out when you're around family members. Mm -hmm. Um, when I, when I'm in the air, if I'm in someone's home that there's a heavy energy in there, whether there's a lot of negativity in there, my soul picks up on it. And I tend to, yeah. um, I get really tired immediately. So, yeah. You know, so on top of that being depressed, you having this heavy energy a on you. Yes, a spiritual sensitivity. Yes. Was, yeah. so, I know, so I was going into many homes where there was a lot of sadness because this loved one is about to die. So the families are, are, are depressed about that. Whatever energy is in there, because mm -hmm. that's, you know, I don't know if that's another story, but there are energies in a home when somebody's on their way out the door. Oh yeah, a lot of energy that we can't see. So that was draining me. So those seven years was hell because <laughs> um, I love my okay. job. I love being a blessing to many people. One of the things, the one of the gifts I have as a nurse is that no matter what I'm going through. So you got to keep mind, I was this heavily depressed person, but when I went into people's homes, I literally left that at at the doorstep. At the door. Because I remember my one of my managers so, said to the group one day, she said, when you go into people's homes, you're supposed to bring Disney World into that home. Yeah. So I, till this day, I always bring a, a good energy into people's homes. I bring happiness um, because I'm not going to, I don't, you shouldn't be, you're going through something anyway. So why am I going to make you feel worse yeah. than you did before I walked in the door? Yeah, so, you're, you're at a point in life where you can't get up to go to the doctor or, you know, yeah. so somebody has to come to you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Once I realized that, you know what, hospice, I gotta go. I like the visiting nursing aspect of it. So I just became a regular visiting nurse. Um, so what, what, what burnt you out of the whole hospice um, situation? The families. Because I was depressed, I also became paranoid. So like, and, and maybe it was, um, just the families themselves. But one of the things that used to piss me off was that I would, I had my own set of patients and I would explain to them over and over top and bottom of what's going on with their loved one. Um, I'll say, okay, like prime example, I, I know I gave you this joke before. I had this one case, the patient was actively dying. Actively dying means that they're gonna be dying within a day. Um, mm -hmm. She was deep breathing. She was, her, her temperature was to the roof. Her feet were blue like the Smurfs. And so wow. I, stood, I stood by the, the, the bedside with the son. His mother had some kind of liver cancer, so her belly was big. And I mm -hmm. said to him, and all the symptoms I saw, and I said to him, you know, mom is in the last stage and she's gonna, you know, be moving on soon. And after all I explained to him, he turns and looks mm -hmm. me in my face and says, when can we start physical therapy? <laughs> When can we start physical therapy? This is how, this is what was happening. I was getting burnt out. So I, my eyes popped wide open and I looked him dead in the face. I said, you know what? I'm going to call my boss and I'll give you the answer by the morning. He said, okay. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you think that he was just not in a place to accept the reality? Yeah, a, lot, a lot of them are like that. So that's what burnt me out. As a depressed black woman, then, you know, when my colleague that comes, because I was like one of the only black nurses in my department, when my colleague comes behind me who was non-black, you know, they would ask her all the same questions and get the same answers from her that they get. That you me. gave. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why are you questioning what I told you? I'm a registered nurse. I know what the hell I'm talking about. So mm -hmm. do you think I'm not telling you the truth? So that burnt me out. Cause I was just like, oh yeah. Hell no. it's, I, I think especially with the the type of people that you were dealing with. Yeah. That yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs>
unfortunately, yeah. and in the areas that you would be going to. Oh yeah, you know. oh yeah. You know, so they, you know, they didn't believe me all the time. <laughs> and then they would say, "She said the same thing you said." Oh, okay. you, you don't say. Really, she did. <laughs> but I was never disrespectful. Never. So you you um, went to the you went and got into the visiting nurse part of life. That's that's yes. the next chapter was the visiting nurse chapter. Yes. And with the visiting nurse chapter, how did you feel your mental state was as opposed to the hospice nurse chapter? So my mental state was the same and I became empty when it came to my spirituality. So so I, I masked my depression with work. So I literally was working six to seven days a week to mask my depression. And I think it was a thing where at least I was good at something. And um, mm. thing that I want to say it brought me joy to work every day. But I knew that I was bringing to the table. You I were doing something mean meaningful. Yeah. My, yes. In my family, we weren't as we weren't struggling like we used to. And I thought that aspect of my life of, of us not struggling like we used to would make me happy. But I was still unhappy. Um, and so with me, I um, I wasn't talking to God. Like, I would pray to God ever so often. I would say, hey, God, uh -huh. like, if I if something went, went, went wrong or, you know, I, I needed something and there was a tragedy in my family, I would pray to God. But I wasn't talking to God on the regular. That wasn't. And I was ashamed to talk to God because I felt like I don't talk to you like that. Um, so why should I talk to you unless I need you? Because I, I felt like I was not worthy. You know, mm. but the, the flip side to it was I was the type like if I as a hospice nurse, even because even during my, my hospice years, I wasn't close to God either. Um, but I would always talk about God with my patients because they needed that towards the end of their life. So mm -hmm. because of my upbringing, I would talk about God like as if I was a one of his disciples. Not but doesn't mean that I, when I went home, I was practicing what I preached. Um, I wasn't a bad person at all. It's just that I just felt like going back to what I said. I felt like I was not worthy because I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't putting my time in with God. So like, why bother him? I I got a home. I got a good paying job. I one thing I would do is I would thank God. Like I would thank God uh -huh. outwardly, and I would teach my kids, you need to thank God. Um, you know, even I even did a routine with my kids, and I started from when. Um, my youngest one, when she was like in, um, I want to say when she was like third, fourth grade, and she's a, a, a 11th grade now, when she was in third, fourth grade, I did a routine in the car every morning on the way to school. Every day, somebody would pray in the car. We would take turns. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the only time I prayed was in the morning with the kids. I'm like, okay, who praying? And so, because my whole thing was because of my upbringing in church, I knew you got to respect God. Like I, I knew that. Yeah, you, you got to respect gotta God. Put, you got to put him somewhere in this equation. Yeah. 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 And I didn't, and I didn't want God to feel like, you know, dad, your mom had you in church, even though she wasn't going to church, she had you in church. So how come okay. you can't have your kids in church? And we did, I did have my kids in church at one point. It was in the little junior, uh, junior choir. So I did yeah. try that at one point, but um, I fell off because I, I literally chose to go to work instead of go to church. So, um, and I, and I ask God for forgiveness for that. Um, and I will say this, I'm not a holy roller. So, um, and COVID doesn't help because now we have definitely don't go to church, but, um, and I always felt like, you know, God in my heart. So he knows that I'm not choosing church over him. But, um, I just wanted to point out what you said about the fact that you was just like, I don't come to him all, all the time. So I don't want to just come to him for my, my stuff. Cause you yeah. know, there's this starving children, there's war, famine, yeah. you know? So a lot of people be like, he got better. He got more important things yeah. to do than to hear me and my issues or hear me and my problems yeah. where it's supposed to be known or we're supposed to know that God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He can see and be, you know, all yeah. to whomever seeks him. But yeah. a lot of times when we go through our own issues and our own circumstances, we really don't focus on that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I was, I, I would say I was a person who was living empty, but I was, um, I was going day by day doing my regular things, like doing my wifely duties, doing my motherly duties, 
um, doing my job. Um, but I just felt empty. I just wasn't happy. I would only be happy if there was something to look forward to. Um, when we, when I, whatever the event was, whether I was going away for the weekend or going on vacation, like I said before, but I was just living. I wasn't, I, I was just existing. I wasn't living. Yeah. So, um, you actually said something to me and I, I, I don't know if it was just to me, but you said that you didn't want your girls to get that close to you, but you encouraged them to be very close to one another because you don't know if and when the day comes that God takes you from them and you wanted them to be close to each other. And I will never forget that. Ever. I remember, I remember when that. I said that. I remember when I said that. I think I was at your house. Um, we had like a girls night, I think. Yeah. I yes. That. yes. I remember saying that. Okay. okay. Because um, the love that me and my mother had, because I was the only child. And so um, that love that I had for my mom was like so deep. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's only one other time I felt love like that, you know, compared to my mother's love, and I'll talk about that soon. So my mom, it was just, it was just the two of us at one point. So mm -hmm. when I lost my mother at the age of 26, that was scary, and I felt so empty. And I really think that a bulk of my depression, um, the intensity of my depression, was because of her death. Because my mom was. Do you feel that you grieved, or you had you had the opportunity to grieve the way you needed to? Um. Yeah, you know, one thing I will say about my my husband, like he he gave me all the space in the world to grieve for her. Um, and I always tell people, you can't put a time time stamp on when you should you how long you should grieve because grieving is all on on the individual. Mm -hmm. And so with me, I grieved for a very, very long time. So I really feel like my grieving was intertwined with my depression because she was that person in my life that any, any problem I had, she had the answer, any problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so not to have her um, to help me with my problems. So even when me and my hubby had problems, I can go to her we'll go and, to him. Uh -huh. and she mm -hmm. was like the or he can go to her and she was that person that would help us you know mm -hmm. or she would give me advice and put the mirror in my face and show me how i was the wrong one and it seemed like because she loved, loved hubby so much that it seemed like he i was always the wrong one but she had a way of <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> she had a way of pacifying me to make to show me like where i went wrong and then you know and they call you know pat her, her the son that's my she's like that's the son i never had <laughs> that love that love that i have for my mother i don't want my kids to feel that hurt and that pain when i die because i had a hard time functioning on a daily basis without her in my life and i had to fake it till i made it for them and I couldn't yeah. appreciate yeah. being their mother because my mommy was gone, you know? So, and it's like, and I didn't want mm. them to ever, I didn't want them to ever feel that hurt and pain that I had from my, from having, not having my mother. I don't want, and even to this day, I don't want them to have that hurt and pain. Cause that just, Ooh, that loss, that loss, yeah. feeling the losses. Yeah. And yeah. then on top of that, I lost my father at the age when I was 19. So, but mm. when she passed away, I didn't have no parents. So you said you have the out of body experience. Can you just kind of explain to the audience what, in your definition, in your um, in your view, what that actually means? So I'll be honest with you. I really think that I, for, my soul completely left my body, completely. So I truly believe that I died. I died and I came Ooh. back. So I, if I have to put a medical word to it. I died and came back, um, but because I came back, I, I, I call it an out of body experience, but I, I truly died and came back. And the reason why I say that is because when I was, my soul was out of my body, no angel or nothing came to me, but they showed me that I died. So that when I went to whatever level I went to, I understood I was dead. So that was deep. Mm. <laughs> 
So, but, okay, so what, why do you think it happened when it did happen and how did it happen and where were you? Okay, so, so I'm going on with life as usual. And so it was a group of us that went to AC this weekend. But at that point in my life, I was just existing. I was that person that, you know, whatever I, I you know, I just was trying to, I was trying to find peace and happiness. But now I know then what I know now, I realize that my spirit guide was really trying to work with me and try to give me hints and clues and I was not getting it. I was not getting it. My, my spirit guide probably was pulling his or her, her hair out, trying to show me a way of getting peace and happiness. And I just was, I was like a, there was a, a, a curtain over my face I had, um, I wasn't smelling the roses. I couldn't see anything but misery. You couldn't see the fires because of the trees. Yeah, I was just miserable. But if you so saw would you, me- would you say, sorry. I'm saying, if you saw me, you wouldn't know I was miserable because I was great at masking it. Even in my house, I was great at masking my misery. My The way I masked my misery in my house was going to sleep. Mm. So, so would you say for, for the average person or for somebody that is walking through life, having some of the same feelings, some of the same um, relationships with people, some of the same type of grief, that God does send you signs. Yes. Sometimes it's warning, sometimes yes. it's stop heifer, you know, and we just yeah. don't want to see it. We don't want to see it. No, we don't want to see it. Nope. So like somebody's watching this video right now, and they're not gonna get it because they have a curtain up. And so I pray that um, whoever's watching this, and if it's not for you, it's for somebody else, please send it to the right person because- Well, I already said that before we leave, we definitely need to pray. Yeah. Pray for, you know, just the, okay. the community okay. as a whole and, yeah. you know. So yeah, so I I, um, I was getting signs and I just I just wasn't, see, wasn't seeing them at all. And, um, this particular weekend, we went to Lansing. It was a weekend of, um, it was like the last weekend of 2019. It was a group of us and the last day, which was Sunday, it was, um, the evening was a little, it felt a little off. My husband and I and my mother-in-law were the last three left and we went out to eat dinner and um, because we were celebrating my husband's birthday. And so went to dinner, came back to the room, took a little nap, woke up, I was still tired, got in the truck. My husband said he was making a, making a stop at Walmart, which is like maybe a mile away from my house. So from okay. to Walmart, I was, I slept the whole way. Like I literally got in the car and slept. Mind you, by the time we left, it might've been 9, 30, 10 o'clock between that time frame. Okay. We get to Walmart. When he pulls up, he wakes me up and he says, um, do you want to come in with us? I said, no, y'all go ahead. He says, do me a favor, lock the door um, when we come out. And I said, okay. Thank God I didn't lock the door because some things tell me if I didn't lock the, if I did lock the door, um, I don't think I'll be sitting here. <laughs> so, so as soon as they walked out, the, got, got out the car, I didn't lock the door. I went right back to sleep. Mm -hmm. Then I wake up. Oh, I, I, I appeared in the parking lot. Like I see the cars and I'm walking in the parking lot. I even see the truck, but I'm like, how the hell did I appear in the parking lot? Like I was really baffled. Like when did you open the door and get out the, the truck? Then I see my husband and my mother-in-law walk out of Walmart into the truck. But when they was walking, they were crying their eyes out. And I got a quick message that said to me, you died in that truck. The ambulance already picked your body up. They had to go inside a Walmart and fill out some paperwork because you died in a, in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. And now they're, they're getting back in the truck. I got that message really quick. So I'm like, while, oh. while it was going on. Yeah. I'm standing there. I'm standing there watching them getting in the truck. So, okay. They needed me to know that this is what happened, that I died. Immediately, mm. I was taken to another realm. I don't know how I got to this realm. I was taken to a realm where it looked like 
an abandoned area. Just imagine the block you live on, but it's mm -hmm. very gloomy and it's abandoned. All the houses are abandoned. That's the best way I could explain it. And there's no okay. sunlight, but I, but I will say this. When you looked up in the sky, you saw this bright, extremely bright, bright light. To the point where you look up, you couldn't even like look at look it. Look directly into it. Yeah. So then when you when you went put your eyes back down to where your surroundings, it was gloomy, like kind of wind. You know how winter days sometimes you don't see any sunlight at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what like. So you would think with a bright light like that, that where it I would was, be I still was, shining where you were. Nah. So you Nothing. look, up, you couldn't see, you couldn't even look, and then when you look back down, it was very gloomy and the sense of sadness. The best way I can explain the sense of sadness was the, the the worst day when you ever felt your saddest, whether somebody passed away, whatever, you times that by 10, that's what that was what the area felt like. Mm. So I'm saying to myself, okay, you're dead. You're either in hell or heaven. And this damn sure ain't heaven. Because heaven is not sad. The stories I heard it's about not heaven sad. is mm -hmm. not heaven is not sad. So I'm like, mm -hmm. this gotta be hell. But I had, up until that point, I had, I heard, listened to stories, I, I read books, and I also um, saw videos on YouTube up until that point about people that visit heaven and hell and what heaven looked like and what hell looked like. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, we're not burning up here or there's no like, I didn't see demons, but it was just uh, like a sense of sadness. And I said to my, I, it was like being in shock. And I remember saying to myself, oh my God, I can't believe this is my new life like this is this mm -hmm. is me mm -hmm. now i'm looking around i see people but people are not like together people are separated um i go into this abandoned strip mall because i looked down on my feet i had no shoes on i my feet were i was barefoot mm -hmm. so i go into this abandoned strip mall and this um asian lady was sitting there she was you know how like you know how strip mall there's booths so it was yeah. an it was an abandoned strip mall like when you went inside, there was booths in this building and she was the only booth that was open. It was weird. So I remember looking up and I saw shoes on the shelf, but they were old shoes. And mm -hmm. so what I realized it was that they do a bartering system there. So I didn't have nothing to barter with this lady. So I, I said to her, and it's crazy because I don't even know if I spoke to her, but she knew I needed shoes. So she mm -hmm. hit the side of the wall and it opened up like a little, like a little cubby opened up. And um, so she was hiding stuff in there and she took a pair of socks out that was like dingy. Um, mm -hmm. and it was in socks as it went up to my knees. She gives me these socks and hands it to me. So I go outside, I'm sitting on the curb and I put on the pair of socks. When I put on a pair of socks, these two young boys come up to me. They must've been like, I'll say 19, 20 years old. And they were the only two people I saw together. Everybody else was separated. But you got to keep in mind, if, the, if I saw the next person, maybe they were like a quarter of a mile down. It was not like anybody was close. So these mm -hmm. two kids came up to me to rob me. And I'm like, shoot. What? So I'm like, yo, I'm here. I'm about to get robbed. And I just was like, oh, my God. I went like this. And then they just looked at me and then ran into the building and ran out with some of the Asian lady stuff. They took some of her stuff. Wow. So now i am got these socks on and I'm like, now I'm talking to God. I'm like, God, what did I do wrong to deserve to be here? And, and get almost robbed by, by yes. two, two young whippersnappers. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what did I do wrong? I'm like, God, if you bring me back, I will praise your name, please, God, uh -huh. Uh -huh. please. Uh -huh. So then there was a man, I, I went up to this guy, he was shuffling, shuffling. And I said to him, sir, is this hell? Shuffling, what, um, like shuffling, walking? Like the way he was walking, he was just shuffling. Oh, he was okay. Just shuffling, he was just okay. shuffling. And I, I, I see his face clear as day. I'm looking at his face right now. And he turns to me and he goes, no, this is not hell. And then he turns back and he just starts shuffling again, walking away from me. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, what the hell? I was scared. Okay. I was, it was so many emotions. Cause I'm like, you died. You in a place that I can't believe you made it to. I mm -hmm. didn't realize my life was that bad that I deserved to be here. Mm -hmm. 
I'm like, so the kind of person I am, I'm like, I just can't sit here on the curb and just wait. And wait. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I said to myself, I got to figure out something. I got to figure out what happened to me. I was like, okay, maybe I can get some answers. Cause I was just like antsy, like this can't be it. Yeah. So yeah. now I, so I'm going to go to my house and cause I'm looking in the area. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I realized that the area I was in was the abandoned area where Walmart was, where the Walmart, where we were parked at, but it was, okay. it, it was daylight. So I said, okay, I know where I'm at. I can run, I can get to my house. But then I says, no, you already feeling sad. I don't want to go home and feel worse. I knew by going home, I was not gonna be able to talk to anybody. I, I had that common sense to know I'm not gonna be able to talk to these people at home because I'm dead. So I knew I was dead. So I okay. said, you know what? Let me go to my aunt's house and maybe I can get some answers over there knowing I, I was dead. So okay. I go to the, the road where the Walmart is and I'm running on the road. Mind you, there's no cars, it's just abandoned. Everything just looks dull. Just d d desolate. Yeah. So I'm running because her house is literally like by car, her house is five minutes away, five minutes away from the Walmart. So I'm running on the road, running on the road. So I see light because it was the gloomy area. I see light in mm -hmm. real time. My husband and my mother-in-law are coming back to the truck. So as they're coming back to the truck in real time, I'm running, I'm running and it goes back to nighttime. In, in where in in my realm it goes back to nighttime so i'm running i'm looking at the road i'm looking at the road and then my husband in real time opens the door that i didn't lock so when he opens oh, the door that i didn't lock i went from seeing the road to seeing the dashboard of the car oh. so i went from road dashboard when i when i went to dashboard it wasn't that simple i went like this <laughs> like mm -hmm. that, like, but it was deeper. Like I mm -hmm. inhaled really deep and both my husband and my mother-in-law was like, what was that? Like they, they were started by the noise I made. Yeah. Soul, yeah. They were like, what? Yeah. My soul re-entered my body and I went <sighs> like that. And so I was sitting and I was frozen in the chair. I didn't move. Oh, did I you, stopped. did you tell them? Did you like not at that point? Not at that point. Okay. I didn't say not one word. Okay. I was processing everything. I sat there like the Indian chief with my hands on both my knees, looking at the road. And the whole time I was in shock, like pure shock. I couldn't believe this happened to me. I didn't say one word to anybody. I just sat there frozen and no one spoke to me. They didn't realize like, you know, something happened to me. Get home. The kids, you know, open the door for us. They had the packages. So they, they helping them with the packages. I'm walking in like a zombie. And my husband said, Keish, like, what's going on? You haven't spoken since we got back in the car from Walmart. From Yeah. And I said to them, I says, when you guys were in Walmart, my soul left my body. And my mother- -in -law, And he turned at you and was like, no, oh, yeah. we, 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 we need to, we need to, we need to commit her. Cause clearly, yeah. <laughs> You know what? I don't, I don't really remember his response. I do remember my mother-in-law's response. She went just like this. I know you're not lying. She said, I know you're not lying. She said, cause the way you inhaled mm -hmm. when you opened that car door, she said, I know you're not lying. Mm. And even, even the next day, cause she, she was staying with us for a couple more days. The next day she was talking about how I inhaled my soul back in my and body. She's never, she's never, actually seen that in real life more no, more so no. you know watching the news or what not the news watching a movie or something like that that's so, where you would see something like that he wanted to hear my story again i told because i told him my story that night and then i told her that story again gotcha. in the morning and um when i tell you it went from being shocked to being happy like i was happy Girl, mm. I was like, oh, whatever depression I had for the moment. My depression came back a little long, a little later. But for three uh -huh. weeks, three good like, weeks. Oh, glad morning. I was, <laughs> I was like, thank you, Jesus. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You could have came and told me that you stole my car 
you lit my house on fire. As long as you didn't tell me somebody in my family got killed or they died. I was, what about if they slept with your husband? I don't even care. You, I want, we can work this out, boo. We can work <laughs> this out. I don't care. Like that. That's how it was. I did not care. I was happy, happy, happy because I knew that if I did not come back, I would have been stuck there for a very, very, very long time. Stay tuned for scenes from part two of this episode of A Maven's Tale. A lot of people believe in God, they know God exists, and will have this high anxiety of dumb things. And, 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 and that's, that's where, that's, that's kind of where it kind of is like, hmm, because you do meet or you do encounter people that are Bible-believing, faith-based people that, that believe in God, but yet, if somebody says something to them out the way, or if you have, um, if somebody's taking too long in the line at the store, or you know, you literally go into this panic attack, but yes. yet, so it's like, you yeah. know, light and darkness can't, can't occupy the same space. Yeah. So it either gotta be one or the other. Yeah.